Thanks again for joining me here at Preaching the Gospel that Saves, the station that is dedicated to our Apostle Paul's, my gospel, not the Apostle Peter's, gospel of the kingdom, not the Apostle James, gospel of the kingdom, not the Apostle John's, gospel of the kingdom. This station is dedicated to the Apostle Paul's gospel. He calls it my gospel gospel. He calls it my gospel three times in God's perfect words of 1769 King James Bible. Now, I hope you're not mad today. I hope you're not going to call me a heretic like that one person Adam did. A heretic will teach you that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a New Testament, which it's not on the authority of the Bible. Okay, Hebrews 9, 15 through 17 tells us that it's Old Testament until Jesus Christ dies on the cross. So if you're in some denomination, non-denominational place that can't even teach that right, you need to leave. Or do you like the pastor? There are so many reasons You need to leave the place that you're going to right now. Another reason is they're not teaching you Paul's my gospel that saves your never dying soul. They're mixing it with Romans 10, 9, and 10, right? That you have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? You have to confess with your mouth, right? Well, that's a work. In Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul's talking to Israel. And again, if you don't care about what the Bible says and who the Bible is talking to, then you're going to call someone a heretic. Because usually people that do call other people names when it comes to the Bible, it's because they don't know the material. They don't care about what the Bible says. They don't care about the translation issue. They have no idea about Westcott and Hort. They have no idea about the Lucian recension. Look that one up. No idea. And they're in the pulpit teaching you, and you trust them. How about this one? This is a good one. And you've probably heard it with the Gabby and Brian laundry thing going on, right? That's like the top story of the of the week. And now everyone's a critic about it. How about this one? He's going to go to hell. Brian Laundry's going to go to hell because of his behavior, right? Well, that's wrong, according to the Bible. Okay? We're not Israel. We're not under a law and a covenant. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 tells us that. There are no promises, according to Israel, that are for anyone today. Ephesians 2.12 tells you that too. Okay? We're not of the circumcision. We're not of the uncircumcision. Colossians 3 tells us that. Galatians 3 tells us that. There's no Jew or Gentile today. But yet, we're not under the law, we're under grace. But yet, every pastor is going to tell you that your behavior matters. And it does, okay? But not when it comes to your salvation. Okay, when it comes to your service, it does. If you want to get rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But when it comes to salvation, and people are saying that because of Brian Laundrie's bad behavior, he's going to hell, how can anyone say say that? They only say that because they have no idea what the Bible says. The reason why people go to hell isn't because of their behavior. It's because of what they trust. Do you trust Christ's payment for your sins? His shed blood on Calvary's cross? Because if you do, then you're going to heaven. That has nothing to do with your behavior. That has everything to do with what Christ did for you. And good behavior doesn't get get you to heaven either. It's what Christ did. It's what you trust. Okay? And guess what? That's Paul's my gospel. 
1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Trust Paul's my gospel, and your never dying soul will be saved. It's not based on your behavior. It's based on the finished work of the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood on Calvary's cross as payment for your sins. So as we continue to go through propitiation, I know your pastor's preaching that this morning, right? Sunday morning, you're sitting there, and he turns to Matthew, and he calls it the New Testament, and it's before Jesus Christ dies on the cross. Or he tells you to read the book of John, because you just got saved, because you came down front and prayed the sinner's prayer, and you got water baptized. Well, that's not Paul's my gospel, so clearly you're not saved, and everybody in the book of John isn't saved today. John even tells us in his own book that the salvation is only of the Jews in the book of John. So why would you read the book of John if you're a newly saved Christian? The only reason why you would read the book of John is because your unsaved pastor told you to read Israel when they're not saved. Because that's what's going on in the book of John. I know, it's tough, right? I'm a heretic. No, that's what the Bible says. Your 1769 King James Bible. John tells us in chapter 4 that salvation is only of the Jews. And guess what Paul tells us in Galatians and in Colossians? There is no Jew today. So what do you do with that? Do you mix it all together and call people heretics? All right, I'm done with the heretic thing. Adam, if you're listening... You need to study to show yourself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15 That's the only way you're going to show yourself approved unto God today. And you need to get yourself a Bible to study. Because if you're studying in NIV, God is not going to work effectually in you. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 So, as we go through propitiation, again, Paul, after his history lesson of the world, shows us in one verse two things going on for Israel as to how they are justified. Talking about believing Israel, circumcision, and unbelieving Israel, uncircumcision. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 30. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Did you notice that? Two crowds and two ways to get justified. Oh, but I thought everything was the same in your Bible. No. Words mean something. Does uncircumcision mean the same as circumcision? Does by mean the same as through? The uncircumcision that this verse is talking about is unsaved Israel. How do I know? Because I can read, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So if you're Israel and you resist the Holy Ghost, you resist Peter's Gospel of Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for remission of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? You don't get the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what does the gift of the Holy Ghost do for Israel? Well, first of all, they speak in tongues. They all spoke in tongues in Acts 2. Okay? So if you're an Acts 2 Christian, you know, like Schofield was, he was an Acts 2 dispensationalist, are you speaking in tongues? Because they all did in Acts chapter 2. Okay, that Holy Ghost that Israel gets, the gift of the Holy Ghost, okay, enables them to go through the tribulation. 
That's the whole purpose of the gift for Israel of the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's not so they get some Holy Ghost zap like everybody thinks today in, in the Pentecostal churches and they bark like dogs and they roll around on the floor like curly. That's not how it works today. Those guys are just a bunch of liars, okay? First of all, when you're speaking in tongues, you need an interpreter. And when you speak in tongues, take a look at 1 Corinthians 14. It's all about tongue talking, okay? You have to speak in tongues to unbelievers, not behind your four walls in a church. So what you need to do is, is you, get, you need to go to the local mall and speak in tongues. I know, I believe my Bible and you don't, and it's hard. Well, you need to get over it and start, get yourself a 1769 King James Bible. Start believing it. Rightly divide it. Believe who's talking to who and what they're talking about. And ask yourself, does the body of Christ fit in? I'm not under the covenant. I'm not under the law. I don't get Israel's promises. Do I fit in? I don't tongue talk. I don't tithe. I don't get water baptized. Do I fit in? So clearly this verse that we are studying is Israel in time past. They get their sins remitted, right? Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Notice, through the forbearance of God. First, I want to point out before we look at the word forbearance that you would have a completely different study if you were using a new translation. Look at how it reads in the New American Standard, right? Romans 3.25 whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished. And then how about the Message Bible, which we used to joke around and call it the massage. It's going to massage you right to hell. Romans 3.25 and 26 Mr. Patterson says, God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear the world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This is not only clear, but it is now. This is current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. Both the NASB and the message add so many words to the text. Did you notice that you lose valuable cross-references like time past, like remission, like forbearance? Wow, who cares about those words, right? We'll just use the massage and we'll just trust in the one translator that put that whole sloppy mess devilish translation together and but you know what if you were in the tsunami I'm gonna donate that to you isn't that nice that's how I got it if you gave to his ministry he would donate to tsunami relief isn't that amazing? So all those people got this dumbed-down translation from the pit of hell. They'll be lucky to find Paul's my gospel. They'll be lucky to understand what a soul is saved. Cross your fingers, hope to die, right? So now let's look at forbearance. Oh, well, I can't if I'm using a new American standard. Oh, I can't if I look at the massage. What is your pastor using? Does it matter? Any translation will do. That means no translation is true. Well, let's get definition, okay? We're going to get it from the 1769 King James Bible. It's only mentioned twice, okay? Romans 2.4 and Romans 3.25. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. 
whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It has to do with the riches of God's goodness and long suffering that leadeth to repentance. Did you get that? Let's compare the Bible definition with our 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary. And again, I'm gonna, I say this almost every message because I use the Webster's 1828 just about every message. And the 1828 is before the Westcott and Hort corrupted text of 1881. Remember, the Bible's definition is always first. And then we look at other resources. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, forbearance, the act of avoiding, shunning, or omitting, either the cessation or intermission of an act commenced or withholding from beginning an act. Liberty is the power of doing or forbearing an action according as the doing or forbearance has a preference in the mind. The forbearance of sin is followed with satisfaction of mind. Command of temper, restraint of passions. The exercise of patience, long-suffering, indulgence towards those who injure us. Lenity, delay of resentment or punishment. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering. And that's the other reason why I use Webster's 1828. He has Bible verses in his definitions. And that's Romans chapter 2, which I read from your 1769. King James Bible. The Bible's definition is right in the verse, and it is the same as Noah Webster's. I had a person ask me the other day the meaning of vexation. I told them to read the verses that contain that word, and the Bible will give you definition. They gave me a puzzling look. You need to be a Bible believer. Your 1769 King James Bible has a built-in dictionary. It is God's perfect words without error. God's perfect words without error. As we continue through our study of propitiation, next time we're going to look at what John has to say about propitiation. And I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to say it again. John is not talking to anyone today. John was a minister to the circumcision. Galatians chapter 2 Verses 7, 8, and 9 confirms that. And the Lord Jesus Christ only sent him to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that you would find in Matthew chapter 10. Thanks again for listening. Email me from my contact page at preachingthegospelatsaves.com for any doctrinal questions. Okay? Don't be a coward and just post it on YouTube. Okay? Again, I do not respond to YouTube. I do not debate what I believe. There's nothing to debate. I believe it. I've studied it. I'm fully persuaded. Romans 14, 5. Okay? If you're not, you need to study. Okay? Don't fall into the trap of evangelical, liberal Christianity. Okay? Just like Billy Graham did. Anyway... Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channels, subscribe to my bookstore blog, and check out, I got an, another new message up for my study on Ephesians. Thanks again.